Rules you didn't think you need to have, but alas, here we are. Rule 10, if you cannot sketch it, you cannot draw it. Obviously, this seems pretty true. If you don't have the ability to put some of the base shapes together very quickly to make them into a system that illustrates exactly what it is you're trying to illustrate, regardless of how far you go down that path, you're probably not gonna be able to make it come out the way you want. You're not gonna be able to render it correctly. Now, sometimes there is a little bit of back and forth with this. Sometimes things can be a little hard to define in the sketching process and the rendering portion of the drawing can actually do a much better job of bringing that to fruition and making it look correct. But generally, if your sketches don't communicate what you want them to, if the composition is lousy, if the proportions are off, it's not gonna matter. It's not gonna matter if you push it through and take it all the way to the finished draft. So spend more time in your sketching period and uh, this will usually take care of itself. Rule 11, if you cannot make it work in black and white, you're not ready for color. Ooh, goodness. Color is dangerous. I used to tell my students this all the time. And of course I'd get very funny looks from them because that sounds like such a weird thing. We usually start young kids with color. Markers and crayons and things like that are pretty ubiquitous for young children, but color is dangerous. It can be a tool that you use when you're not ready for it yet. And you can make things that feel beautiful. They're chromatically, they're really interesting. But if you take that and convert it to black and white, a lot of times the contrast levels are just really, really odd and low. And so I think it's very beneficial for any artist, wherever you are in your, your art journey, whether you're young, whether you're old, uh, start with black and white. If your goal is to make things look semi-realistic in any capacity, start with black and white, work in grayscale. If you're working on digital art, this is awesome because you can literally build everything in black and white and then build a layer on top of that that colorizes it. Is that the best option forever? Probably not, but it's a great place to be when you're learning. And a lot of these rules are based on uh, students learning. All right, rule 12. Smiley faces are for elementary students. Actually, smiley faces on sons are for elementary students. So originally this rule said smiley faces on sons are for little kids. Um, but yeah, it's one of those rules that I had fun with when I was first starting to teach and it was interesting and funny. And of course, students would often take, uh, liberties with this and in drawings that had, <laughs> that were rendered to a really interesting and high quality level, they would then put a cute little face on their son. And sometimes these faces would be really elaborate. I have one student in my mind that I'm remembering that would f do full ren uh, full rendered versions of faces, often with you know old wrinkly noses and ears and sunglasses and things like that. So um, this is a good example of one of those rules that is silly and really doesn't have a whole lot of seriousness in it, other than just the underlying piece of this, which is don't lean on your schema from your childhood. The things that you learned about drawing when you were a little teeny kid they don't always apply when you get older. We learn how to draw people when we're young by drawing circles um, and then just attaching limbs to them. That's obviously incorrect, but uh, it, it works for the child. It works for my daughter, who is three and a half at this moment, and her drawings of herself are often just a sphere with limbs kind of shoved on like toothpicks. That's great for her, um, for her schema at her age, but as you get older, you have to detach from those schemas and move on into something that is a little bit more adult and more mature, if that's what your pursuit is artistically. So that's really where the rule comes from, but mostly it was just kind of a silly, fun thing. Rule 13, do not drink the mineral spirits. <laughs> the sad part is this rule exists for a reason. Mineral spirits are the, uh, the alcohol-based solvent that you use for oil paints most of the time. There are There's a movement now to get to mineral spirits that are non-toxic and that don't affect the environment negatively. Um, when I was in college, we had massive 50-gallon drums of mineral spirits that would just sit in the back of the classroom. And on days where it was too cold and we had to close the doors, the fumes would build up in the room and it was not a good thing, not a pleasant thing. Um, 
But yes, don't drink the mineral spirits. They have dissolved oil paints in them. And if you're working with old school oil paints that have things like cadmium and cobalt in them, you have potentially dissolved heavy metals. Um, yeah, it can lead to some really, really damaging things for your kidneys and your liver. So don't drink the mineral spirits. Rules you didn't think you need to have, but alas, here we are. Rule 14, clean up after yourself. Obvious, please. But rule 15, clean up for your neighbor if they can't handle cleaning up for themselves. So at the end of the day, the room needs cleaned. Things need to be put away. There's other people coming in later and you need to make sure you take care of your stuff. And so if your neighbor is doing a terrible job at that, then yeah, you had to take care of their mess. And that usually led to some positive pressure on the student who didn't clean up to do so next time. Uh, that camaraderie and the friendship usually that was built up and then you know you had a little bit of leverage to push that person and say, hey, please like do your job next time, please because I don't like doing two people's jobs. All right, let's move on. Rule 16, if you cannot describe it in written form, you do not truly understand it. This is, for adults, I think probably true. And written form, as opposed to verbal form, is, I think is a choice made specifically because most people, if given the ability to write something out, are going to do that more proficiently than they would if they had to be put on the spot and do that verbally in the moment. So this comes from a lot of the ambitious, creative ideas that we as artists have in our minds, and we want to try to get that onto the page. And a lot of times it exists in your brain as this beautiful, awesome, creative thing. And when you try to write it out or talk about it or sketch it, you can't get it. You can't communicate that thing. And this rule is a casual reminder that you probably don't understand it as well as you think you do. And you need to have some humility and go back to the drawing board, either mentally or literally, and try to hash that out and figure out what it is. When you have the ability to describe it in written form adequately, you probably understand it at a much higher level. This is something that is reiterated in the educational world a lot where they say, you don't really understand something until you have to teach it. And that's true to a large degree. If you're working on geometry and you're getting it, you're nailing everything, but then the teacher says, okay, now go explain it to this student who's struggling, you're probably gonna run into, oh goodness, like I don't really know how to explain this. This is an intuitive thing for me. And that's then beneficial to the other student because you're struggling, you're gonna have a better understanding of it. You've got empathy for that student who's struggling, so yeah. If you cannot describe it in written form, you do not truly understand it. I stand by that. Let's go on to the next one here. Rule 17, you can eat the tempera paint, but it is not recommended. So tempera paint is um, in the classroom kind of a predecessor to acrylic paint, which is then a predecessor to oil paint. And tempera paint is, at least in my experience, made of elements like egg or eggshell in the old days, and some of it still is, I'm sure, but mostly made of non-toxic elements. And so it can be ingested, but shouldn't be. Obviously, you shouldn't be eating paper. Paper's not, paper's not going to hurt you, but you shouldn't be eating it. Um, and again, yes, this is a rule that exists because somebody did, in fact, try to eat the tempera paint. Um, probably because I told them they can't eat the acrylic because it's just liquid plastic. And then they proceeded to go, well, what about the tempera? So this rule, this rule exists for a reason. Rule 18, too bad. I don't think I need to explain this one. It's just good to have a rule like this in the classroom when students would ask, you know, why not, or would complain about something and I could just go, rule 18. And again, they would walk over and look at the list of rules and go, and kind of give me the evil eye. Um, I did not use this in a manner that was degrading to any of the students. It was just, again, a funny kind of community and cultural part of the, uh, the classroom. And I would be lying if I said that I didn't have a student use it on me on at least one occasion. Rule 19, quick does not mean sloppy. Okay, so just because you have to put something together quickly doesn't mean that it needs to be messy or gross or sloppy. 
And this probably comes from gestural drawings, things where we only have a minute or 30 seconds to illustrate the human form, to illustrate a particular still life. And it's easy in that moment to give up mentally, to say, well, this is gonna be stupid looking because uh, I don't have enough time to make it look adequate. So slowing down mentally, even when you have to speed up physically, it's good to remember that quick does not mean sloppy. It might mean that even though you only have 60 seconds, you might only make 10 marks. So think about what each of those marks are going to be and put that specificity into each of your, your brush strokes or your marks. Okay, rule 20, making something darker does not always mean push harder. This comes from a lot of tears in paper. A lot of students who would accidentally push their crayon, their pencil, their brush, whatever, just a little bit too hard on the paper or the canvas and they would actually push a hole through it. So you might know, hopefully, uh, that you can create darkness by layering things, by continuing to go over uh, that pencil and uh, those pencil marks or by going over that field of watercolor. You can continue to layer to create things that are darker. So again, being hasty and trying to make it dark really, really, really fast and punching a hole in your paper is not an optimal result. So just slowing down and understanding that you don't have to push harder to make it dark. You don't have to rush to make it dark. Sometimes you just need to analyze the particular situation and the need and then figure out how to proceed from there. Rule 21, seeing correctly is the most fundamental aspect of both painting and drawing. Oh, this one could probably be an entire video on its own. It is a, an immense subject. So this is something we run into at a very young age when we start drawing and illustrating, is we try to draw something and it falls very far short of whatever the subject is that we're trying to, to illustrate. And this is because our ability to see the incorrectness or the correctness of a thing is much more highly developed than our skill to actually render it and put it onto that page. So seeing correctly, analyzing things and looking at them and understanding how they exist and the shapes that make them up and, and where they sit and are situated in our three-dimensional world is going to be the first step toward making something come out accurately. So... This is a skill that you refine as long as you are learning how to do anything artistically, is seeing correctly. Um, and this also has to do with what I mentioned earlier, breaking that schema that you have. A nose is not a triangle, an eye is not a, the shape of a lemon. Those are good analogs when you're learning. But the reality is every eye is shaped slightly differently. There are trends, there are things that you can memorize that are pretty close, but the reality is that you have to look at that thing and really truly understand what it is and its shapes and its colors and its value. And then if you work from that, from seeing correctly, you're gonna end up with a much more realistic result that is adequate or more adequate to your perfectionistic artistic sensibilities. Rule 22, your memories are made of emotion and not detail. Uh, the exception to this is if you have a photographic memory but most people do not. And most of our memories seem to be comprised of our feelings, our thoughts, our emotions that are connected to that particular visual memory. This is the reason why in your brain you can call up something you've only seen a couple times, like an elephant or a rhinoceros, but when you try to draw it, you can't actually draw it to the level that you would like to because most of that memory is not actual physical detail. Most of that memory is made up of the emotions and the feelings that you had in that moment. This is also just a good reminder to be gracious with yourself. It's not that your brain is broken and you can't represent things adequately enough because you can see it in your head, but you just can't get it onto the paper. That's most people, so don't, don't fret. But it also is then a, a good reminder that you're gonna have to go back to that source material and copy that rhinoceros 10, 15, 20, 2,000 times before you're actually able to do it from your memory. Because every time you do, you're filling in gaps in your visual memory. Gaps that then later on don't exist when you're trying to put that thing together from your mind. So it's a great rule, but it's kind of a hard one to wrap your head around. Rule 23, be anything but boring. Um, we're gonna end there because that is one of my favorite rules. 
Uh, first of all, it's 23, which is kind of the family number. But also, be anything but boring is great. Uh, I would rather have a student who is rambunctious and maybe agitating on the wrong day than one who simply doesn't provoke any thought ever. And this is true in my personal life. This was true as a teacher. This is true when I think any of us are watching a video or a movie, uh, reading a book. The worst thing that it can be is boring. You'd rather have it be controversial and even agitating, but be anything but boring. Dedicate yourself to something interesting. Do something worthwhile. Take risks. Try to do something hard. Be anything but boring.